And I want to take you down to Isaiah chapter 28. And we're speaking again about excellence in ministry and the complete titles, the com commission and commitment to excellence in ministry. And we said again that God never commissions us to do anything that we're not trained to do. God didn't say, go be successfully saved and strong in me. And then he didn't give us an instruction manual. He instructed the men and women of God to write the vision and make it plain. And then the Holy Spirit has been given unto us for instruction. Think about that. Whatever God is commanding you to do, there is a training season that goes along with it. No matter what thing you feel like, man, I got I to gotta struggle with that. You can be trained out of a struggle. You can't, you can't do the genie thing. You can't blink it. You can't winkle your nose. There's no abracadabra. There's no magic. And y'all know how I hate witchcraft and magic. There's no, no dust. And then there's also no, I just say in Jesus' name and it should go. No, it leads with training. Somebody say training. It leads with training. Your anger issue will leave with training. Depression will leave with what? With training. Confusion will leave with what? Out of control emotions will leave with what? Fear will leave with what? How many of you guys, you were on your job the first day, maybe you were uh, doing customer service or you had to pick up the phone or do the computer, and then trainer was there and said, okay, now I'm going to let you do it by yourself. I want you to take your first customer. And then you're like. <gasps> but after a while, you, you, you check, you texting on your phone, not even supposed to have it. You chewing gum. You checking your email, and you're answering calls. Why? Because your training completely took away the anxiety and the fear, and confidence took over. There's some things in the spirit that we might be in a place where we say, God, I'm not so sure that I can do that. It can be done with what? The commission means God will take a people and train them and then say, this is your assignment. Go forth. And it's not something we hesitate or something that we struggle with. So the commission and commitment, that's our part to excellence in ministry. And I'm just going to read one or two definitions to you, and we're going to go to Isaiah 28. Uh, but the first word that we looked at was the word excellency. In the Hebrew, it was gayon. So God talks real country. But it means, it means pride, excellency, majesty, pomp, swelling, arrogancy, if used incorrectly, proud, if thought about incorrectly, but this word gayon means exaltation, majesty. It means, uh, um, then there's gauth, which is another part of it. It literally means uh, raging, lifting up, excellent things, a rising up like a column of smoke, a swelling of the sea, the majesty of God. It literally means God begins to put on us what is him, that makes him great. He puts on us what is of him that makes him great. He puts the ability to be uh, majestic, the ability to operate in excellence. He puts the ability to swell up, to raise up, to, to be powerful in the earth. He puts that ability on us, and it's called the excellence seat. So he equips us before he commissions us to be excellent. And then we looked at the word adir, which is another Hebrew word for excellent. And it means, of course, to be excellent, to be famous, to be gallant, to be glorious, to be goodly, lordly, mighty, mightier, a mighty one, to be noble, to be principal, and to be worthy. And when I, every time I read that, I hear when God called Abraham out in Genesis chapter 12, and he said, I'm going to bless, bless you and do what? Make your name great. And he says, I'm going to increase you, and you shall be a blessing to all the families of the earth. What was he saying to, to Abraham? I'm going to put my excellent seat on you, and it's going to perform something in you so powerful that other people will pick from your fruit, and you will be famous. 
That's what God is putting upon us. Somebody say, I receive that. I receive that. Praise the Lord. And so as we go on and we looked at being faithful, um, we looked at another word for excellence, and it was the word tuar. And it means to have a trade or to be a merchant to seek out or to spy out. It literally means God gives us the ability to search into things by his spirit. And I don't want to get ahead of myself because I will probably touch on into another word that's similar to that uh, concerning Daniel and when God gave Daniel ability. To give ability is to put his excellency upon. Think about this. If God made the spirit realm, who understands the spirit realm? God. And he can give what? Understanding. God can make us so clear in our thinking, so clear in strength in our body, so clear in thinking in our plans, that when we do things in the earth, whatsoever we do shall what? Prosper. Somebody say, I am a prosperous person. In the making, in the making. I, am I am increasing by every word of God. Word of God. Now, I'm going to take you something in Isaiah chapter 28. Let's go down to verse number 23. And this one, you're going to have to pay just a little bit of attention. And you're going to give me a little space. And you're going to use a little bit of your own imagination. And uh, it doesn't say Publix or Rainbow Foods, or Kroger in here, but we're going to talk about food. But what it's saying in this verse that we're about to look at is God knows how to make us better at what we need to live with. You ever had a new phone, a new computer? He's like, finally, I'm going to go look at the instructions. How many know everything in your life God could train you with? everything. And so here it's showing how God gives a farmer wisdom to get a better crop. Verse 23. It says, give ear and hear my voice, hearken or hear intently and hear my speech. Does the plowman, the farmer, plow all day to sow? Does he open and break the cloths of his ground? So plowing up his field. Verse 25. And when he is made plain or took out all the rubble, the face thereof or the surface Does he not cast abroad the fitches, that seed, and scatter the cumin, which is another seed, and cast in the principal wheat, which is another seed, and the appointed barley and rye, which is two other seeds? So that's five or six seed, God says, in their place. Verse 26, let's read loud with a in concert. Come on. For his God does instruct him to discretion and does teach him. So he's saying something as simple is knowing when and where to plant a seed so that that kind of seed can grow to its highest ability, God is interested in teaching the farmer. God can teach you how to run a daycare. God can teach you how to run a business. God can teach you how to run businesses. Come on, somebody. God can teach you how to run government. God can teach you how to restore broken systems. That's what it's speaking of. Verse 27, it says, it says, now it says, now wisdom is needed. It says, speaking of the different harvests or seeds, verse 27, for the fitches are not threshed or separated or harvest with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned or rolled upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff or stick and a cumin with a rod. Verse 28, bread corn is bruised or, you know, you got to get you some grits, right? some cornmeal because the fish is coming, right? Bread corn is bruised or ground because he will not ever be threshing it or break it with the wheel or bruise it with his horsemen. Verse 29, let's read. This also comes forth from the Lord of hosts who is, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. It literally says he has to plant them in different places he has to plant them in different seasons, and when he takes them out of the ground, he can't, he can't treat all seed or harvest the same. It says, this 
verse 29, this comes forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel. Literally, think, think about this. In Genesis chapter 1, and God made the herb and the herb bearing seed, and his seed with, was within itself. And then God says, when I finally get a person to listen to me, I'll teach them how to grow all these different kinds of seeds. There are things in the earth that are literally waiting on one thing, the instruction of God. How I many you know that everybody in this room, you came from the seed of your father? How I many you know there is an instruction on how you were supposed to grow and how you were supposed to mature <clears throat> and how you were supposed to function in your maturity? And guess who has it? God does. Isn't that powerful? I'll give you one more little verse. Verse 26 again. For his God does what? Instructs him to discretion and does teach him. So when you're speaking about the excellency of God, you're literally speaking about God wants to instruct us with every single thing that we do that we don't mishandle an opportunity. You know, you know, a little kid, you know, especially little boys, when they, when they got a toy and they can't get it to work right, what do they do? Boom. And what do they say? I can't get this thing to work right. So when they can't get this thing to work right, what do they do? Some of y'all are like, well, I do that in my computer too. And they do what? And they depend on how much it costs, they do what? We throw it against the wall. How many of y'all have thrown away opportunities because you couldn't get it to work right? I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. I am your encourager today. My name is Curtis. I'm your friend. I can't get this relationship to work right. I can't get this job to work right. Right? Just throwing things away and the wisdom of God was standing there going, I could instruct you. The excellency of God saves people and time. Let's go down to the book of Daniel. This is going to be a blessing. I want to say this to all the beautiful people who wonder if going to church is worth it. If hanging around the word of God is worth it. Sweetheart, sitting on that beautiful purple seat, listening to the wisdom of God is so <laughs> much less expensive than a lawyer's fees or a doctor's office or a psychiatrist's couch. Come on, somebody. Or losing your business. Come on, somebody. Or losing your house. This is so much better. And I just want to say this, and, and I want to continue to be happy because I have been instructed to be happy. Come on, somebody. But there are whole businesses that are set up all around us from where we're sitting. They're set up to deal with people who could not deal with the thing that they were supposed to steward. They, and so they have, they have divorce lawyers. And I'm not picking on anybody, because all of us in here are under pressure. Come on, somebody. They have foreclosure offices, right? They have health clinics, and they have all of these, all, think about all of the, they have payday loan places. Come on, somebody, tell me. They, they, have, they have schools for those who could not handle, what, public school, or they have these, they, they have whole industries. Come on, they have credit repair, credit reconciliation, credit, uh, you know, all this other stuff, and it's basically, if you look, if you, Please, don't. you drive certain down certain uh, uh, sides of town. All you will see on the billboard, every advertisement, if it's not for a burger, it is for people. You've messed up your life. Come to me. Pay me money, and I will help you fix your life. Yeah. Buy here, pay here on this side, and help me help you. Let me help you fix your credit on this side. Come on. All of the lawyers got their billboards on this side, and all of the ones, you know, come, come, you know, to your dream home on this side. And we are literally walking through life paying for our ignorance. And let me tell you something else. You don't pay for it with money. You pay for it with years. Because when you mess up enough money, it could take you what? years to get back to start. You can mess up your body, you can mess up your mind, you can mess up the relationship. We're literally paying for our mistakes with our life. 
Isn't that powerful? Money is the cheapest thing you will ever exchange for your breakthrough. The most expensive thing you're paying it for is years. And God is standing there saying, let me give you wisdom. Come on, somebody. So that you can use your years to have prosperity built on seasons of prosperity, built on seasons of prosperity. God is saying, I don't want to have you, you know, the car that's stuck in the mud just spinning their tires while the years pass, much less sliding back. This is the value of what being saved and coming to church and being around teaching is about. It's not just um, a sleeping pill because you can't deal with the world. This is supposed to be a wisdom center where you, come on, and the excellency of God and the power of God and the illumination of God, and then we leave this place and we go out in the world and dominate. I say we go out into the world and we what? Dominate. That's what the word of God is for. People who think church is boring don't understand what church is for. So Daniel chapter 12, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 5, excuse me, going down to verse number 12. Hallelujah. So Belshazzar the king, he's, uh, he's getting a little happy. It was a happy hour. It was uh, two for one drinks. And so you look at verse 1, and he, he drank wine, and everybody was drinking in verse 2. And then you drop down to verse 3, and everybody was drinking in verse 3. You drop down verse 4, man, they was, they was, they was happy. It was the middle of happy hour, because in verse 4 it says, and they drank wine and praised. So they had the music going. Y'all thought nightclubs came with neon lights, didn't you? They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, the OJs, and the, no, wait a minute, and, all right. And, and, and the God of silver and brass and of iron and wood and stone. So they were into idolatry. And then God came to the nightclub in verse 5, and he wrote on the wall with his finger. And then in verse 6, the king saw that, and all of his, it blew his high. He came right out of his high, because it says in verse 6, and the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loose, and his knees smote one against the other. And the king did not reverence God, verse 7, so he cried out to the astrologers. He cried out to the astrologers, so he went to the gas station and he got a dream book and he tried to understand what was going on with him. And to the soothsayers, and the king said to the wise men of Babylon and to all his homies, he said, whichever of you guys can help me see what I got when I was high, I know it was something deep. I, just, I know it was something from the spirit realm, but he didn't know God. And so they all came in, and they could do nothing about it. And so you drop down to verse number 12. They called Daniel. Verse 12, come on. For so much. Let's read in concert, y'all. For so much. as Dang, man, that's, that's, that's commas. That's commas. There's periods. There's consonants and vowels. <laughs> Excited people for... Maybe that happy hour thing just got some people. <laughs> Verse 12, come on. For so much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpreting of dreams and shewing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will shew the interpretation, or literally demonstrate. Let me read that to you. An excellent spirit and knowledge. Isaiah, what we saw in 28, God will give counsel and instruction. The Holy Spirit will put someone in the midst of the world who does not have a solution for the spiritual experiences that they're having or the problems that they're having or the mistakes that they're making. God will have a person sitting there trained and filled with excellency and knowledge. This excellent spirit <clears throat> is the Hebrew word, is another word for excellent. It is called yatir, Y-A-T-T-I-Y-R, yatir. And it literally means exceeding or preeminent. He had an excellent spirit. His spirit was stronger 
than any other person's spirit or soothsayers or sorcerers. See, I, I love to teach this kind of stuff early on a Sunday morning, especially in January. I don't, I'm afraid of psychics. I'm filled with greater is he. They may do things in the spirit, but whose spirit is stronger? His spirit is stronger. They may try to do things to your spirit, but whose spirit? Is your human spirit stronger or their human spirit stronger? So Daniel shows up. He says, verse 14, let's read. I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee. Listen. And that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. He had learned to draw from the excellent sea of God so long, so often, so consistently that he had a reputation for being excellent, for being raging, to be lifted up, to be lordly, lordy, mighty, mightier, a mighty one. Come on, to be exceeding, to be preeminent. They said, that guy, when you come in contact with him, he solves problems on a regular basis, whether they be in the natural or in the spirit. The excellency of God is not just what's running laps in here and waving flags and speaking in tongues and talking about imaginary things or spiritual things or uh, things that people think are odd. Therefore, going out there and doing business well and, and doing school well, come on, somebody, and doing community well. The same anointing that makes you spiritual in church will cause you to balance your checkbook at the house. Some of the young people are like, what are checks? Daniel chapter 6, verse number 1. Watch this, the same anointing. Somebody say it's the same anointing. Same. Daniel chapter 6, verse number 1. It says, this is the new king because the other one, he checked out because he, he couldn't, he, he misappropriated happy hour. Verse six, chapter 6, verse 1. And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom, listen, 120 princes, which should be on over the whole kingdom. Now, remember the excellency of God, no matter what arena that you're in, is going to bring you where? To the top. Verse, verse 2. And over these three presidents, he said three presidents, come on, verse 2, of whom Daniel was first or chief, that the princes might give account, plural, accounts to them, and the king should have no damage. So here it is. God would set the leaders up, 120, then he had three over 120, and then Daniel was the one that was the one preferred of those three so that the whole realm would work like it was supposed to. This had nothing to do with visions, dreams, or interpretation. This had to do with business, education, commerce, law, road structure, building permits. Verse 3, let's read in concert. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. I don't want to go to church. Church is boring. Y'all spend too much time in there. I'm, I'm going to go out. I got to go make me some paper. I got to go do my business. I got to make my dreams. I got to live my best life now. Sweetheart, you're learning this stuff now that will cause you to shoot past everybody out there that's experimenting with their life. I don't have time to develop that, one, but one of the most dangerous traps is a young person with time who think that they can experiment their way into wisdom. How many of y'all know some of those experiments are costly? Again, that word there, excellent, is your tear preeminent, very exceedingly excellent. Let's go down to 1 Corinthians 12. So the commission and commitment to excellence in ministry is extremely important. God is not just saying have more church. He's not saying have more ministry. Come on, somebody. He's not necessarily saying pray more or outreach more. He's saying what? Do it well. Do it with wisdom. Do it with training do it where it can be measured, do it with a sense of accountability, do it with vision, do it in the right time, in the right season, with the right people, in the right place, and watch the prosperity of God come out of it. 
All of us know, and I, I'm not, I don't want to belittle anything, but all of us know one of the biggest enemies of everybody in your family getting saved is that they've been around the wrong church. Or there's some knucklehead at the, at the job with the biggest Bible that was ever made sitting on their desk, and they send everybody in their office to hell every day. That taco dip going to send you to hell, all that taco dip. <laughs> God says in uh, second, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12, he's speaking about the gifts of the Spirit. Let's get verse 20, uh, verse 27. Verse 27 is good. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Let's talk about some church folk. That was a pretty good word there about business and the anointing, wasn't it? Look at the flip side of this. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. It says, now, come on, now are ye, now the body of Christ and members in particular, and God has set some in the church. That word set is a dame. First what? Apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, this is powerful. I'm just going to say this because I love the pastor and I love to teach. He set some in the church. The word ordained means to affix or to screw in or to put into a position of power. Therefore, there's no such thing as a church age that should not have had apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. If there was a church anywhere at any time, it should have had all of these things in it. Verse 29 says, are all what? Apostles? Prophets or all teachers or all workers of miracles? Because he just told you in verse 27 that we're members in particular. We have a left hand and a right hand and left foot and a right foot. So we have different members of the body. Verse 30, have all the gifts of healing. God uses people in different ways. Do all speak with tongues? And I believe that word there is diversity of tongues because it follows it up. Do all interpret? Because we're all supposed to receive the prayer language, but it's saying, do all have the ministry of tongues that needs to be interpreted? I believe that's the correct application there. It says, verse 31, verse 31, y'all ready? Come on, together in concert, come on. But covet, that word there is desire, but covet earnestly or on purpose the best gifts, and yet I shew unto you a more ex exceeding, preeminent, higher, swelling, raging, more prosperous way. So think about this just for a moment. The most powerful church full of the most powerful displays of the anointing with the most powerful people with the most powerful titles. And, and Paul looks at it and says, you know what? That really looks like strong church. There's something higher than that. And he begins to take them into chapter 13, verse number 1. He says, though I speak with the what? Tongues of men, different languages, and of angels, and have not love or charity or the type of love that gives and does not expect a repayment, and have not love, I am what? Become a what? Sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, we say that it's not that he became a bad musician. It literally means that he is trying to operate but there is not enough distinction enough to get clarity out of the display of his ministry. Let's slow down right there. I feel the Holy Spirit resting right here. I can be an apostle without love. I can be a prophet without love. I can be a teacher without love. I can operate in miracles without love. I can operate in healings without love. Man, I can even be in helps without love and governments in the church without love, but, my, when, but when people try to receive from my ministry, they can't see how to do it. It's like a song when the two and the three, and it's like, I want to join in, but your rhythm is so off, I don't know where I can get, I fit in. 
and I want to listen to the melody, but the melody is so all over the place. Come on. I can't release myself to the song and enjoy it because it's not clear enough. Think about a ministry. Come on, are y'all with me? That is trying to minister in Jesus' name, but they're not doing it in excellence. So the people that want to get to Jesus have problem getting to Jesus through you. See, ministry, ministry it, we, we can't just say we're going to speak in tongues, we're going to walk back and forth, we're going to teach all the stuff about the Ecclesia and the Metron, and we're going to be as strong as apostles, and we're going to teach about, we're going to teach about seeing things and seeing things. We're going to be the strongest prophets, and we're going to exegete the scriptures, and we're going to talk about the Hebrew and the Greek, and we're going to be the best teachers, and we're going to be the strongest governments. I'm telling you, we got the best systems here, and we're, hashababa, we're going to lay hands on everybody, and come and receive, 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 receive. You don't want it, you want it? Come if you want it, lift your hand. We, everybody's going to get healed and, and everybody's like but you just cussed me out in the front of the church I'm confused excellence in ministry must begin with after I have prayed with you I need to walk rightly before you watch this or if I'm going to pray for you next month I need to live right when this month. I am going to pause. I'm just going to stop in, in verse 3 here because we're about through. I'm just at verse 3. I'm going to stop. But excellence in ministry is not about the anointing. The anointing. My anointing. Our anointing. I don't know what a little voice that just jumps on me. I the anointing. But there's some people that come in there so anointed. But I'm like, your character stinks. Well, I just want to pray, Pastor, can I, can I, can I, no, 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 you, stop, sit down, stop praying for people, stop, stop, stop. Because excellence in ministry, listen, it's not just looking at your anointing. It's looking at have you allowed the love of God to develop the release of your ministry, We, we, excellence in ministry is not chasing after the anointing. Excellence in ministry is, I understand that God uses the anointing to build people slowly. I'm, I'm, I'm going slow on purpose. I know I should be sweating and the deacons should be shouting, but I'm still going slow. Because if, it, if what we said that the excellence of ministry is God's power that is what makes him like he is, that he shares with us. He shares it with us in detail, on purpose, over time to build a specific product of people. Just like the corn and the fitches and the cumin and all of those particular crops in Isaiah chapter 28, when you plant something, that's what you expect. Come on, somebody, and it comes up the way it comes up, and you have a different purpose for it. You don't you don't put the corn where you put the spices. Oh, you listen to me. Listen to me. So when God begins to bring together a people, the body of Christ, he is releasing anointings. He's releasing words because he's looking for a specific product of people. And so if, if, if the corn grows up, y'all you know, all saw that, that corn, it's in the store, and it, it looked like it's ready to fight. You know, it's got like, the, it's just like all bald. He's like, that ain't my piece of corn. I get corn somewhere else. You know, and so when, when God, come on, when God, when God grows up a people, he's not looking for mean, come on, selfish, backbiting. He's also not looking for depressed Soon angry. See, he's looking at it. He's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I release my word to produce. Yes. Now, it may jump up and holler, I'm anointed. He says, yes, you're still corn, but you're not my corn. Amen. Amen. See, many are called, but few are what? No. See, your, gift and the, your gifts wake up when you begin to step into your call. But even you can function in your call, but it still doesn't mean you are chosen. You can be in ministry and not chosen. 
How long? Years long. <laughs> the most precious possession that I own is not of this world is when God looks at me and he says, you're my friend. <laughs> he looks at me and he says, you are trustworthy. Amen. When God looks at me and he says, you are faithful. Yeah. Or I take pleasure in what you're doing. You can have all the rest of this stuff. Come on, somebody. Because God is looking at me, not as you see me. He's looking at the product of himself that he grew out of me. And saying, this is exactly what I bargained for, what I sowed into. Yeah. See, God is looking for a product. And so he says here, verse, we're only going to verse 3 and we're really through. He says, but if I'm doing all that anointing at the end of chapter 12, but I don't have love, I have become a product that is not functioning correctly. Yeah. Listen to me. There's no such thing as excellence in ministry without the love of God. It can have an ark out front and a driveway that curves around and plants in each corner and spotlights on the plants and programs in the foyer, right? And soft music in the bathroom when you go in there and, and heated seats. Come on, ladies, I got you in mind. We're going to get excellent one day. And, and, and it, you can come into, every time you walk into the sanctuary, the little thing on the wall goes, pushoom, pushoom, and it puts out little fragrance and everything, and it's got soft music there, and you come in there, and I'm telling you, and somebody yells across, what you doing in here? Your kind don't belong in here. You can have all that, but it's not excellent. Excellence is literally Will you love well whom God sends? Your anointing is not the ministry. The people are the ministry. The anointing is what God uses to help the people that he sends to you for help. Some preachers love their anointing more than they love people. When that baby started crying and nobody helps the baby but the mama. Everybody else is offended. The baby tries to help the mama. Some people love peace and quiet more than they love the child. You're messing up my anointing. No. I came with a problem and now you're going to have to use your anointing to bring me comfort. Some people love the anointing more than they love people. Only got like two minutes. But I never want this church to get so spiritual. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastor, they come in here, they're messing up our prayer meeting. That's the point. We prayed them in. Now it's time to change the prayer meeting. <laughs> We're so sweet, aren't we? Verse 2 and 3. He says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand how much? All mysteries, deep. And all what? Knowledge. And though I have what? All faith so that I could remove mountains, have gotten results, and have not love, I am nothing. So the stamp of approval is not prophecy. The stamp of approval is not the things you've seen in the spirit. The stamp of approval is not how much scripture you can pro quote, and the stamp of approval is not manifestation. The stamp of approval is all that God has trained you in, are you allowing him to, you, to love people with it through you? Come on, y'all. Y'all know we can stay there a whole hour. Because sometimes people teach and believe that if I'm prophesying, that's ministry. If I memorize scripture, I therefore in ministry. And if I see in the spirit, I am in ministry. And if I get manifestation, I am in ministry. No, you are in training. Yeah. And when you can take all that and love people that are not like God, now you're ministering. Yeah. 
verse 3. This is where we end. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not charity, it profits me nothing. It literally means you can have frequent flyer miles from going all across the world, and you can have taken selfies with all the hungry kids. And finally, you get caught in a nation that does not allow you to preach Jesus. So they ship you back in a box if they can find you. And they say, oh, he gave his life for the ministry. If he or she was doing that for selfish reasons, the kingdom looks at it and says, that was not excellent. It profits what? Nothing. See, the goal is not outward ministry. The goal is what? Inward ministry. And I pray, as it, even if we'll, we'll go further in this, of course, that as God teaches us about excellence in ministry, yes, we will work on the facilities. Yes, we will work on our diction. And yes, we will work on our clothes. Yes, we will work on all the things that will not offend people up front. But the most important thing about holding ministry and excellence is, is your and my heart in the right place with God even with difficult people from season to season. Somebody say, I will, I will choose, the way choose the way of the Lord, of the Lord regardless, regardless of, how of how I feel because I know, because I know my, feelings my feelings change every day. Every day. Therefore, Therefore, I set, I set the, love the love of God as my standard, as my standard of, interaction. of interaction. I will. Stay on, Stay on God's side, God's side toward, people. toward people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Give Jesus a hand praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs>